If you turn now with me to Mark's Gospel, we'll continue our study in chapter 6. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, and we're considering the verses 40, 45 to 52. And I'm sure when we were seeing that last psalm, you're probably wondering whether those words, or at least in the Hebrew, those words were going through the disciples' thoughts. And when they were in the storm, and then he, when Jesus came, he turned that terrible storm that they were in into calm and brought them to the haven that they had been desperately rowing towards. We won't read this section itself, but as we come to each verse, we'll read each verse. And if we were to compare Mark's account with that of Matthew, it would be obvious that there is much of an overlap between the two accounts. This incident is not found at all in Luke's Gospel, but it also occur occurs in John, and that's why we read it. And in Matthew, one of the major differences between Matthew and the other two gospel accounts is that we read of Peter's venture onto the water <coughs> at the invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And also, Matthew is the one that tells us at the conclusion of the entire incident that the disciples confessed that Jesus was none other than God's own son. It's John who mentions to us that one of the reasons why Jesus had withdrawn into the hill was the attempt by the people to make him a king. And I think I did mention before that although we do know of the um, compressed, as it were, temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ when, the, when he's taken by the Spirit into the wilderness and the devil tempts him and suggests that he turn these stones into bread and suggests also that he, the devil, could give the Lord Jesus Christ the whole kingdoms of the earth if only he bowed in worship. Then we're told that the devil left him for a season. And I think this would be one of the incidents as we have it in John chapter 6 where there's the devil whispering into the ears of these, this crowd, the crowd that has been fed by Jesus that they want to make him king for all the wrong reasons. Not king of their lives, but king who could provide them with daily need, this food, just as Moses, through God's del uh, delivery, gave them manna to eat in the wilderness. It's also John that tells us that the disciples had rowed for approximately three to three and a half miles. Um, so they were in the midst of the sea when Jesus came to them. So as I've said in the past, and I'll say it many times again, none of the accounts contradict each other, but many aspects of each account we don't find in the other one. And so we combine all the accounts and we have this wonderful greater picture. It's Mark who tells us that the incident is closely, closely connected to the feeding of the 5,000. And it is, we also find here that there is this fear that the people have misunderstood or in the disciples have misunderstood what was actually was happening there at the feeding of the 5,000. This is the second sea miracle recorded for us by Mark. The other one is in chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, where, as again, I have mentioned this in the past, Jesus is asleep on a cushion in the stern of the boat. And that little detail shows us that this incident had such an impact on the memory of Peter that it lodged there. And he, when he tells Mark of the incident, speaks of this little uh, occurrence, this cushion that Jesus was asleep on in the back in the stern of the boat. And at the end of that incident, the disciples say, who is this man? that even the wind and the waves obey him. And hopefully each and every one of us here tonight know exactly who this man is, that he is none other than Christ Jesus, the second person in the Trinity. 
So let's look at verse 45. Straightway he, that is Jesus, constrained the disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. Jesus orders his disciples to go ahead of him to the western side of the sea, and he dismisses the crowd. Why? The crowd were hanging on to his every word. The crowd, 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. The crowd had now been fed, so they weren't going to faint in the wilderness. Why does he dismiss them? Well, it's getting late. Soon it's going to be dark. We'll read of that later on in this account. And many of the people were far away from home. Yes, he has cared for them, body and soul. He has taught them concerning great things. He has healed them. He has fed them. But now, now the consideration of Jesus is they need to go home. They need to rest in their own beds. He has to dismiss them because the people themselves are not eager to leave on their own accord. And isn't that wonderful? When there's a service and the minister ends the service with the benediction and maybe the people go out into the car park and stay there talking of the things of God. There's an action hymn that Horatius Bonner wrote and half the first half was to be sung before the table and the second half was to be sung after the table had been served. And the second section starts, too soon we rise, the symbols disappear, the bread and wine remove. And doesn't that sum up for many of us, oftentimes when the service ends, it's too soon. It's too soon to rise. It's too soon to go home. No, we want to hear more. We want to speak to those who are far advanced in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, to those who have been far and long time with him. It's too soon. We don't want to go yet. So we can enter into these folks' experience. When the Lord Jesus Christ has drawn near to you during the service and himself through the Spirit has ministered to you, then that surely is your experience. It's too soon. But he dismisses us. Why? Because we can't stay on the Mount of Transfiguration just as Peter, James, and John, especially Peter, wanted to. We have to go down the mountain. We have to return to our daily calling. We have to go back to where God and his providence has set us to live the life of an example of how a Christian lives, to show forth the wonderful gospel in our own lives, wheresoever God and his providence has set us. And from John we discover thirdly that the people were intended to come to take Jesus by force to make him king, which was exactly what he didn't want, as John chapter 18 tells us. He knows their hearts. It's not yet ready to be declared to be king. And it's the wrong type of king that they're going to try and attempt to make him. And fourthly, Jesus desired to have time for private communion with his Father in heaven. Because when he dismisses them, we read in verse 46, that when he sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. But he's also dismissed his disciples. We can understand that the crowd is to be dismissed, but why, why dismiss the disciples? Why not, as on previous occasions, take with him Peter, James, and John, that inner circle of the disciples, or at least John, the beloved disciple, who later will rest upon his breast at that last supper? Isn't this an example also to us, set by the Son of God himself in prayer? There are times when we need to be alone with God. Yes, it's good to attend a prayer meeting. Yes, it's surely a measure of the temperature of a congregation as to how many are attending the prayer meeting. But there are times when we go aside, as Jesus himself said, and we go to our closet, is the phrase he uses, and we pray on our own and have communion with our Heavenly Father. And the disciples time and time again, the, the Gospels time and time again, show us 
how often Jesus prayed, and the description of the prayer is often given too. Luke chapter 22 speaks of the unselfish prayer that Jesus makes. And Luke chapter 23, the forgiving prayer. Remember Jesus, there he is, the first saying of the seven sayings from the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. There's earnest prayer, there's intercessory prayer. This day, I tell you, he says to the thief, today you shall be with me in paradise. There is submissive prayer on the behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. Father, if it be thy will. The picture of Jesus on the hill praying, as was his custom, praying for himself and praying for others, because even though it is now dark, and even though the disciples are halfway across the sea, surely he knows the situation they're in. And although we will consider the danger they were in, were they in any danger at all? Because the Lord Jesus Christ was praying for them in that particular situation. I'm thinking just now of the death of Stephen. Stephen looks up into heaven while he's being stoned, and he says, he sees the Lord Jesus Christ standing. Not just he sees the Lord Jesus Christ, but he sees him standing. And yet in Hebrews, four times we're told that the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Now those two could almost be a complete sermon, and um, this is a little digression, I apologize. No, I don't really apologize for this digression. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty because that aspect of his ministry, that aspect of the atonement is complete. And he, our great high priest, sits because unlike all the high priests in the Old Testament, they couldn't sit. The work was never finished. And no description is given to us in the Old Testament. In all the fabulous descriptions of the tabernacle and the temple, there is no stool, there's no chair, there's no bench, there's nothing to sit on. Because the work was never ending. But our great high priest sits because the work is finished. But we also read he stands before God the Father making intercession. And that's how Stephen saw him, standing before the Lord God Almighty, making intercession for him, Stephen, at that particular point in his great need. And in this time of need for the disciples here, Jesus is in the hill praying for them, knowing the situation they're in. When Jesus prays for you, believing friend, he prays knowingly. He knows the situation you're in. He knows the strength you need. He intercedes with God the Father Almighty. I'm sure many a minister has said to you and many a friend, a believing friend has said to you, I'll pray for you. And we do to the best of our ability. But sometimes memory and sometimes the busyness of life means that we stop praying for the person we've said we'll pray. But there's one, the great high priest himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, who never forgets to pray for you and prays for you continuously, constantly. He says to Peter, the devil has decided to sift you, but I have prayed, and the Greek is plural, I have prayed for you, not just Peter, but you, all the disciples, Jesus has prayed for them. Verse 47. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he, Jesus, was alone on the land. That night, the disciples, when they reached the middle of the sea, John tells us the sea began to stir up because a strong wind was blowing. Matthew tells us that the boat was battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Mark presents us with two scenes. Imagine this. Get your mind's eye at work now. There are the disciples struggling away with the oars. The wind is so bad that the sail has probably had to be reduced. And there is Jesus in the hill praying for them. He is praying. His prayer includes intercession. And humanly speaking, the disciples are in great danger. 
But the reality is they are in no danger at all because Jesus is praying for him. And their, his prayer must have included the petition that the disciples would be spared in order that they would fulfill the mission that they would have they have been called to because the disciples remember in verse 30 are now being called the apostles the sent one they have a ministry they have a mission they have a they will be commissioned in mark 28 they are safe and secure in the will of the lord jesus christ this picture surely contains many a comforting application for the church and for us as individual believers in the time of our trouble or distress. The obedience of the disciples brought them into this situation. They are not in this situation of danger because they've disobeyed the will of God. No, he says, he sent them away, verse 46. Jesus sends them away. They are fulfilling the will of Jesus. And yet danger comes up. This verse alone completely destroys the prosperity theology, the health and the wealth. If you're a believer, you will never become ill. If you're a believer, everything will be right in your life. If you're a believer, you will always have a wonderful salary. If you're a believer, you will never have any trouble at work. So the health and wealth theology teaches. The Bible teaches, here are the disciples following the will of Jesus and the storm arises. And these disciples, most of them fishermen, are in fear of their lives on a sea that they knew very well. They are following the will of Jesus and the storm arises. So believing friend, when you are following the will and, the obe and obeying the commands of Jesus and the storms arise, be assured he's praying for you. Be assured that you are following his will and being assured, be assured that he cares. Verse 48. And Jesus saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he comes unto them walking upon the sea and would have passed them by. The Greek can be translated that the boat was being tortured or battered and harassed by the waves. And Mark uses... Matthew, sorry, uses that Greek word, and Mark uses the same Greek word to describe the disciples, that the disciples in rowing are being tortured, they are being battered, they are being harassed by the waves. And Jesus sees them. The fourth watch is possibly three o'clock in the morning. It's dark, but Jesus sees them. In spite of the water, in spite of water not being a substance suitable for walking, and despite of the tempestuous bellows, and despite of the buffeting headwind, Jesus walks towards them. We could have sang Psalm 77. Thy way is in the sea, and in the waters great thy path. Yet are thy footsteps hid, O Lord, none knowledge thereof hath. He walks towards them without deviation. He walks with, towards them without stumbling. He walks towards them without sinking below the waves. Why? Because he's God. He is able to control the wind and the waves and every aspect of creation. Why? Turn to Colossians, because he sustains all things by the word of his power, things seen and things unseen. Various aspects of the attributes of Jesus at this point maybe warrant our pausing for a little while and considering them. First of all, the knowledge. Jesus was still on the land, and in spite of the darkness, as I've said already, he sees the plight of the disciples. There's a close connection between Jesus' human and divine natures, between his knowledge and between his omniscience. I say it in all regard and respect and reverence that when Jesus was a little boy in his carpenter's shop, 
Conjecture on my part, admittedly, but possibly he would pick up a piece of wood that had not been sandpapered by his father or planed by his father and would have got scalps in his hand. As human as that, friend. And maybe run to his mother to get those splinters of wood removed. And despite the fact that he holds all things seen and unseen, as a child, Jesus still had to learn that two plus two made four. But there are other times when the divine knowledge is given to the human, as it were. But the human nature was never omniscient. And next we consider the power. Mark has already recorded several events which display the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in remarkable manners. Now here, he is going to still the waves by the power of his word. We must also remember that here we are shown God's Jesus' love. These men were no means perfect in their understanding of Jesus, and maybe we are no means perfect in our understanding of Jesus exactly as to who he is and exactly his power and his nature. But he loves us, and he gave himself for us. And so we come to verses 49 and part of 50. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. With the boat heading southwest, the rowers are facing northeast, and they see what looks like a man heading towards them, coming from Bethsaida, Julia. But men do not walk on water. These sailors know that. Thoroughly frightened, they see this apparition, they think. They see this ghost. It seems that Herod Antipas is not the only one who is superstitious. Remember, he thought that John John the Baptist had come to life again. They see, but they do not believe what they're seeing. They can't imagine for a minute that it's the Lord Jesus Christ walking on the water. Has any such thing ever been recorded before? Has any such thing ever been spoken about? Here is Jesus on the water walking towards them. And before we dismiss the disciples as being so slow of faith and understanding, how many people in our own day and age consult mediums thinking that these people have a great knowledge of future events? How many folk read their horoscopes in the paper thinking, it'll do no harm, it's just a laugh. How many people, you see them in restaurants sometimes, throwing salt over their shoulder because they spilt it on the table. There are still silly superstitions around in our so-called wonderful enlightened culture. How many folk avoid or shudder when they see in their diary that this is Friday the 13th or a black cat? I never know which is it. Is it supposed to be good or is it bad? black cats and things like that, or cross the road rather than walk underneath a ladder. Our culture is full of these nonsensical superstitions. So we cannot judge the disciples as they see a man walking towards them on the water. They're shaken, they're agitated, they're troubled. But remember what Jesus says later, Recorded for us in John chapter 14. Let not your, and it's plural there, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. The second part of verse 50. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. The response to Jesus to their fear is immediate. He says exactly what it's needed to banish their superstitious fears. It is I. 
And maybe they don't believe what they're seeing, but remember another incident when Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb, talking to who she thinks is the gardener, turns away from him because she's not interested in him at all, although he's the one he has come to find, in fact. It's not until he speaks that she turns and says, my Lord. The disciples see Jesus, but they're still frightened. But then he says, be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And we've spoken before about this wonderful phrase, it is I, the Greek being ego, I me, I am. And again, friend, you jump to Exodus where God reveals himself to Moses from the burning bush. Who shall I say has sent me? I am. And this great, powerful response, we considered it briefly in the Garden of Gethsemane when the temple guard come. Are you Jesus of Nazareth? I am. And they fall backwards in shock. In the New Testament, it's only Jesus that says, Take courage, do not be afraid. Because it's only him that has the power and the authority to calm our hearts and to enable us to not be afraid and to take courage. Mark doesn't speak about the episode of Peter walking on the water. But we see here in verse 51, he went up into them, into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. The wind stops. Now, you live on an island. You know what it's like to be battered by waves and storms and all the rest of it. And you know that once the wind stops, then still often there's a swell in the sea. But as Matthew tells us, and Mark tells us elsewhere, immediately, Mark using that favorite word of his, immediately the sea is a flat calm. That doesn't happen naturally. Jesus commands the sea. <clears throat> Jesus commands the waves. And they are amazed in themselves beyond measure and wonder. I've already quoted one hymn by a good free Kirker, Horatius Bora. Let me mention another one. If you were ever attached to the Boys Brigade, you'll recognize this. There's a hymn which asks the question, will your anchor hold in the storms of life? And the answer is that we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Why? Because it's fastened to the rock which cannot move and it's grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Again, we're looking back, and again, we have the full knowledge. Again, we have all four Gospels. Again, we can make comparisons. But these poor disciples are frightened out of their wits. And Jesus walks, and Jesus calms the water, and Jesus saves them from drowning, and Jesus says to them, Don't be afraid. Take courage. Why? because it's him, it's Jesus. And friend, this is the reason why in this life we are not afraid and we are not encouraged, because of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the Son of God. It's all about the one who intercedes for you. It's all about the one who came to die in order that your sins be taken away from you. Don't be afraid. Be of good cheer. Be of great courage. Why? Because Jesus is your elder brother. Jesus is your great high priest. Jesus is interceding. Jesus speaks to us through his word still to this day. It is I. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank Thee once again for the intercession and prayers of Thy Son, that even now, 
in this place and others when prayer is being made publicly. Each and every one is being offered to our great high priest for him to clean, to cleanse and to offer to thee our heavenly father. We thank thee for these times together. We thank thee for the knowledge that has been given to us for the Bible tells us so that thou art the God who hears and answers prayer. And we pray that prayers said in this place and prayers unsaid, cries from the heart will be answered by thee, God our Father, beyond our thinking and our imagining. And so we shall rejoice and we shall be happy and we shall know that God the Father loves and cares for us. Forgive us all our many sins, we pray thee. Bless, bless us and accept of us for Christ's sake, we ask it. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his counts upon you and give you peace. Amen.